I've been a criminal barrister for the last decade, prosecuting and defending in criminal court throughout England and Wales. I've been driven to write about my experiences because day in, day out, I see the criminal justice system failing those it's meant to protect. The innocent are wronged and the guilty are allowed to walk free. I want to show you how the system is broken, who broke it and why we should start caring. I am the secret barrister. Tonight, what happens if you're wrongly accused of a crime and you can't get legal aid? You may find yourself spending tens of thousands of pounds of your own money to prove your innocence. I call it the innocence tax. It could happen to any one of us. I'm going to tell you the story of a retired GP Dr. Stephen Glasgow. His troubles started in Bristol Airport, coming home from a holiday in Vienna. We went through the passport control and uh, I, I, I felt a sort of bony hand on my shoulder and I was whisked into a side room. I was then uh, confronted by uh, two policemen in plain clothes who told me that I was under arrest on suspicion of uh, serious uh, charges of historical sexual abuse. And I, I was absolutely stunned. Dr. Glasgow was handcuffed and taken straight to Cardiff Police Station. This was the beginning of a two-year ordeal that would cost tens of thousands of pounds in legal fees. His accuser was the daughter of an old acquaintance. He denied any involvement whatsoever. She claimed that her father had abused her as a child, and then he had arranged for his group of friends to also abuse his own daughter. Um, so it was quite an incredible uh, claim from inception. In the weeks that followed, things got even worse. What she subsequently went on to allege, that he had performed an illegal abortion on her, at his address in the top room, uh, following being impregnated by her own father. Dr. Glasgow was charged with conducting an illegal abortion, 13 counts of sexual assault, and a charge of rape. He was facing a very real prospect of many years in prison. I remember having to stand there in the Crown Court, having these, each of these 15 charges put to me, and having to say, not guilty. 15 times. The fact was that Dr. Glasgow was facing prospects of dying in prison. So, you're accused of a heinous crime, facing a lifetime behind bars, but you know you didn't do it. What are you going to do? Of course, you're going to get the best defence you can possibly get, and that is a Queen's Council barrister. Used in the most serious cases, QCs are the most experienced and the most expensive. Bottom line, I think I'd have spent every penny I, I had. I, I'd have remortgaged the house. I, I'd have done anything to um, get the best defence I, I possibly could. If these accusations had been made against Dr. Glasgow before 2014, legal aid would have been made available to him. And if he was acquitted, he would have been fully reimbursed. But today, any married couple with a joint disposable income of more than £37,500 will not qualify for any legal aid. They may not recoup all the money they spend to prove their innocence, even if they are acquitted. The people I feel sorry for are the people who are in the gap where they don't quite qualify for legal aid, but they haven't got a great deal of liquid funds available. The doctor used his life savings to pay for the best legal team he could afford. What they found was that the police's investigation was less than professional. Immediately there were some red flags for me. I was looking at the way it, that it was being investigated. The defence's primary concern was the investigating officer's impartiality. After looking at correspondence between him and the complainant, they felt he had crossed a line. The officer had developed a, a friendship, really. And when the complainant becomes your friend, it would be very difficult then to be impartial. Luckily for Dr. Glasgow, he had the money to hire medical experts to help in his case. They would look at the complainant's story of her illegal abortion. 
certain of the allegations, you simply thought, well, this, this can't be true. They, they should have been investigated by the police. This, this makes no, no sense. The alleged abortion that he carried out on her, which I think was uh, described by one of the experts that we obtained as from the television, uh, Call the Midwife or Vera Drake. Astonishingly, the defence discovered that this wasn't the first time the complainant had made serious allegations. We also discovered that she'd made a complaint of, of rape when she was 17, which she then admitted was a false accusation. Our group were not, not as it were, her first victims. Uh, that was deeply shocking to us. And of course, the fact that it came out so late, I mean, we'd all been uh, on bail for nearly two years by the time this emerged. The CPS and the police pressed on, regardless of the new evidence. His trial was set for January 2018. Thousands of pounds of public funds ploughed into a hopeless case. Just three weeks to trial, his solicitor had had enough. My solicitor uh, wrote this uh, wonderful letter, which I call the hand grenade letter, because it was sort of designed to cause uh, mayhem within, within the CPS. So I wrote a letter setting out the various inconsistencies and the difficulties um, of their case and saying this was effectively going to be a car crash on their watch. I got a phone call from uh, my solicitor saying they've dropped it. They are not going to take it any further. They've dropped the charges against you and all the others. When we went to court uh, on the 18th of January, where the judge uh, formally found us all not guilty, I was also shown my final bill. And the original figure came to £101,000. Originally, the Legal Aid Board granted me £7,000 back. So my bill would have been £94,000. His lawyers managed to claw back a bit more money out of the Ministry of Justice based on his acquittal. But Dr Glasgow was still left with over £61,000 to pay out of his pocket. We're creating a society which is that if you have the resources and you're accused of, of, of serious matters and you are able to buy appropriate representation, you're more likely to obtain uh, the right verdict than, it, than if you don't have those resources. It wasn't until afterwards, when I had to start signing cheques uh, to, to, to pay my legal fees, that, 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 that it really struck home what the cost of freedom is. Freedom comes at a great price. English and Welsh justice. A fair and equal system, once a model for the world. But not today. With legal aid gone thanks to austerity, only the wealthy can afford the best defence. It's now a choice between risking prison for a crime you didn't commit or facing bankruptcy trying to prove your innocence. Well, in response, the Crown Prosecution Service said, we have a duty to keep all our cases under review and in the weeks before the trial, new evidence became available, which meant there was no longer a realistic prospect of conviction. The case was duly stopped at the earliest opportunity. South Wales Police told us, we respected the decision that new evidence meant there was no longer a realistic prospect of conviction. A review of the investigation was carried out, which resulted in two officers receiving management action. While the Ministry of Justice said, access to justice is fundamental, but we also have a responsibility to ensure taxpayers' money is used wisely and have a strict means test in place, unsuccessful applicants who go on to be acquitted can apply to have their fees reimbursed at legal aid rates. Well, as you saw, the doctor in the secret barrister's piece was able to pay his legal bills privately. But what about those who can't? Joining me now is the criminal defence lawyer, Luke Gittos, and Laura Janes, who's chair of the Legal Action Group. Thanks very much, both of you, for talking to us this evening. Um, Laura Janes, the solicitor at the end of that piece said, if you have the resources and you're able to buy appropriate representation, you're more likely to obtain the right verdict. I mean, on the basis of that case, that sounds true. Well, I'm afraid I think it is. Um, we are now at a stage where legal aid has moved fundamentally from what was first intended. It grew after the Second World War when the country was at its knees. It was invented alongside 
the NHS, but unlike the NHS, it's always been subject to a means test. When it first started, 80% of the population were eligible for legal aid. So probably Dr. Glasgow would have been eligible for legal aid. Now it's less than 30%. So if you are just of moderate means, then actually you're falling into that gap. I mean, Luke Gittos, Dr. Glasgow said in that piece that freedom costs. Do you agree with him? Absolutely. I mean, I think everything in that film rings very true with criminal practitioners. But I think this is about more than money. I think the important point raised by the Secret Barristers films is that what we've experienced is a denigration of the criminal trial process as an institution in this country. We no longer recognise it as the forum in which the rights of the individual are placed up against the rights of the state, who has as at its behest the resources uh, way beyond those of the individual. Such as it was, the criminal trial was a means of levelling the playing field between the state and the individual. We recognise that when someone is prosecuted, they are facing a risk to their liberty and a state that can rely on the resources of the police, the prosecution, etc., in order to proceed with that prosecution. But surely that's Government... an argument in, in favour of extending legal aid, making it more widely available, isn't it? It is, but my, my point is about how these cuts have been justified. And the reason these cuts are justified is because government after government, both Labour and Tory, have undermined the rights of the defendant in the courtroom. They've attempted to make the criminal justice process more streamlined. You know, it was Jack Straw who in the early 2000s said that uh, a defendant's rights lobby is holding up the criminal justice process you know, holding up the process of getting to a conviction. I think the background for these cuts, the reason why they can be socially justified is because we've lost the, the idea of the criminal justice process as an important one, as something which is akin to the National Health Service, something which is central to the relationship between the citizen and the state. So I think that's the deeper political problem that's posed by these reports. And I think the real risk here is that we get so fixated on funding, we get so fixated on the money, that we fail to see that really the whole trial process has become denegrated. The Lord, criminal defendants, and, and of course, also, that film raised Lord, the issue of the presumption let, of innocence. Let me bring Laura James in for, for, on that point, though. Luke Gittell says it's not just about the money. No, it is about access to justice. Legal Action Group is an access to justice charity that has been promoting access to justice, justice and equality before the law for 50 years. And we take quality and the rights of everyone very seriously. So the problem is, is that at the moment, the way in which the legal aid system has been reduced, the spend has halved since uh, 2010. It's a tiny proportion of the Ministry of Justice budget. And the rates uh, that lawyers get have been frozen since the 1990s. Now, actually, I know loads of brilliant frontline lawyers, and that would not affect Luke, their quality on jot, um, but, but it's not right. When the, Luke Gittles said, when the secret barrister talks about a system that's on its knees, taken in, in conjunction with the cuts to legal aid, is it the poorest who are suffering most here? Yes. Well, I think, I think, I think you're... Oh, sorry, I think, I think your film hints at that it's the people in the middle, which is absolutely right. It's those people who can't quite afford to go private, but also don't qualify for legal aid. Actually, the poorest do qualify for legal aid, so can access those funds. So, but, but I think, as I say, the deeper problem raised by your film is about how we treat people in this position. You know, these cuts are justified on the basis that the criminal justice process is seen as basically surplus to requirement. And I think that comes around as a result of a cultural disregard for the presumption of innocence. And I think really what we need to do as a profession is become a lot more political about these things. Criminal defence practitioners need to recognise that they have a political stake in what's going on. And they uh, need to become a lot more active in that sphere and a lot more public about expressing their opinion. Luke Gittles and Laura Jaynes, I'm so sorry we're going to have to end it there. Sorry I couldn't come back to you, Laura, but thanks both of you for talking to us. Thank you.